Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text comes from Genesis chapter 22. One of my favorite games to play with my kids is really a test. I will probably give too much away if they're paying attention. It started when they were little, and I will do it with toys or food, noses, <laughs> even smiles. They will have a cookie, for example, on their plate, and I'll walk by and take it from them and simply say, a cookie for me? Thank you. Now that's the signal that the test has begun. They have only had two reactions. They could fight and whine and argue that what I did was unfair, that the cookie is in fact not mine and it is theirs and theirs alone. The second is simply to say, of course you can have it, Daddy. Now what is the test? Just how much do they love me? Am I higher in their heart than a cookie or a toy or whatever? This is a little game I have picked up from God himself in our Old Testament reading. It is an interesting event recorded for us. It is deeply sad and profoundly comforting at the same time. We see two different ways of looking at death. Sadly, many only give thought to this reality when it comes knocking at their door. Flabbergasted and completely dumbfounded, they are left to announce to family and friends, look, it's a Mr. Death or something. He's come about the reaping. I'm sorry, Mr. Death, we didn't invite you. Now, death is the wage of sin. And unless Jesus comes back first, each man and woman will experience this stark reality. There's no getting around it. Your super awesome niceness won't stop it. Ask Mother Teresa. Your super awesome smartness won't stop it either. Just ask Stephen Hawking. With the death of my family this week, with Holy Week just around the corner, and with the Lord's body and blood on this altar, I'm reminded that death awaits us all. It is the curse of the fall into sin. Death is the breakdown of the body and the soul. It is the very mechanism by which man returns to dust. As we live, our body dies. This I'm reminded of each time I see skin flakes fall off my arm and I get my hairs cut. Here there can also be another way to see these deaths. I know that if I don't remove the dead skin or take care of the dead hair, my body and my head will be more susceptible to disease, which invites whole greater levels of death. To God, from his point of view, death is a game. It is a test. Abraham was commanded by God, take your only son and go sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Now, Abraham was to take the very son of the promise. He was to kill Isaac himself so that he would know the boy was really dead. This was not to be left to servants. He has to do it. The type of offering was a burnt offering. The burnt offering was a sacrifice where the entire animal was burnt and given to God. None of it was to be left back, kept for oneself, or shared with anyone. Abraham was to be all in or all out. God was taking Isaac for himself and saying, Isaac, an only son for me? Thank you. Abraham had two options. He could have fought, cried, and whined. After all, God was seeming to contradict himself. This was the child through whom Abraham was promised many descendants. He could have grumbled against God and thought, this is not a command of God. I'm surely being duped. God's promise was sure that Isaac will carry the promised seed of blessing. Why then does God command he should be killed? This has to be an attack or a trick of Satan. Or there is no doubt then that God is repenting of his promise because he would not contradict himself. So, what have I done? What extraordinary, horrible sin have I committed that God is so deeply offended that he is withdrawing his hand from me? By nature, 
This is the habit of us all. When some physical affliction besets us, our conscience is Johnny on the spot, and the devil torments it with the fiery accusations of circumstantial evidence. A troubled heart looks around inside and outside and considers how it may have offended God. Who sinned? This man or his parents? Often, this uh, leads to murmuring against God, grumbling against God, sometimes even hatred of God. If God loved me, then why did this happen? My God, why have you forsaken me? When there is contradiction by God, it is impossible for our flesh to understand and inevitably concludes that either God is lying or he hates me. Now, it's hard to know exactly what Abraham thought and felt in the three days they were traveling to Mount Moriah. He said nothing to Isaac about what was really happening. Abraham does rely on the promise of God. Even though things don't really make sense, he knows that God cannot lie. God has the power to give life from a worn-out womb of a sterile mother. So he also has the power to make this right. After being burned to ashes, there has to be something that will happen. As God is able to give life to the dead, he gave life to dust. To this, Abraham relied. He trusted in God's holy and sure word. When we are sure about God's will and believe that he has commanded whatever we have under consideration, the matter must be taken without hesitation. If one is exposed to the, even if one is exposed to dangers or death itself, the word of God cannot be without effect. If you want to know what God has to say, if you want to know what God has commanded, if you want to hear God talk to you, hear his word. Now we cannot take away from Abraham's plight. The way in which he exercised his faith is no small matter. He looked for the wood. He cut it. He placed it on the donkey. All the while, he, without a doubt in my mind, felt awful. With fear and great trepidation of flesh, he felt. He was human. He did not have a heart of stone. It was flesh. Should he not have taken counsel with his wife? (laughs) Or deliberated these actions with his friends? I assume moments filled with groans, sighs, sobs, and fatherly tears. However, he saddles the donkey. He is so wrapped up and absorbed in reverence and fear of God that he scarcely realizes what he is doing. Then, for three agonizing days, he traveled with his son. I'm surprised the grief did not kill him. I don't think I would have lasted two hours walking along with my son for three whole days and thinking, here is my son, my greatest hope, my promise in my old age. He has to die, and I have to kill him. For three days, he endured these tortures of his flesh and the fiery darts of Satan. All the while, he endured it in silence because of the command and promise of God. By God's word, he was strengthened and preserved. They get to the mountain. The servants are commanded to stay behind, so they have no opportunity to interfere with the proceedings. Isaac carries his own wood for death, just as Jesus would. Isaac is bound, just like Jesus. Then, as Abraham is set emotionally and physically to kill the boy, God stops the test. Through Abraham's actions, he has looked at God and said, Of course Isaac is yours. Thank you, God. Here we see the power that God has over death. Abraham and Isaac experience the utmost distress. Isaac is ready to die, and Abraham dies in his soul several times. Natural death is the separation of the soul from the body, and it's simple death. The body functions cease, the soul of a believer goes to heaven. The body is laid to rest, awaiting the resurrection. To feel death is an awful burden. Simple physical death holds fear, but eternal death holds real terror. 
to be completely separated from God in every sense of the word is frightening. To truly cry and experience, my God, why have you forsaken me, I can't really describe. But for those who believe in Jesus, he has made that cry. He knows what it is to be truly forsaken by God. God did not spare his own son. He turned his back on Jesus. God provided the sacrifice. Jesus was bound and nailed to the cross. He died the death meant for you and for me. He paid the wage of sin. He gave his life in order for you to live without fear. He broke death's dread prison. Without fear, death is not death. It is a sleep. When Jesus confronts believers who battle death in the Gospels, Jesus will repeatedly say, They are not dead. They're sleeping. When he speaks to Martha at the death of Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. The truth spoken by St. Paul rings for all believers. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the, say, the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Remember these words of the Holy Spirit. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Christ has turned death into nothing but a bee sting. It zips you, it causes you to flinch and exclaim, Ouch, that stung a bit. Then it's over. It leaves a bit of a mark, but really feels nothing. For all who believe in Jesus, death has no sting. It's lost its sting. It has no victory. Like the bee who stings and dies when it tries to fly away, so death has stung the Lord of life, and dead is unable to fly away. Jesus was bound and died, carrying death with him to the tomb. On the third day, he rose from the dead. These gifts are born in believers as their stone-dead hearts are made flesh in the regenerating waters of baptism. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasures in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. With this as our sure and certain hope, we confess and pray as we sing in a wonderful evening hymn, Teach me to live that I may dread the grave as little as my bed. Teach me to die that so I may 
rise glorious at the awful day. Oh, may my soul in thee repose. May sweet sleep mine eyelids close. Sleep, that shall me more vigorous make to serve my God when I awake. These are the blessed truths made yours as the work of the cross, the payment for sin, the victory over death and the grave is made yours. You are washed in the waters of holy baptism. You receive the Holy Spirit. You hear his words spoken and the Holy Spirit keeps them ever yours. You eat and drink your Lord's body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins, for life and for eternal salvation. Your life on this earth and your life in the world to come relies on only one man, Jesus Christ and him crucified for you. He has changed death and gives you different eyes to see. He gives you eyes of faith that see death as God's plaything. God may seem to take away things that we hold dear. He may draw them to himself and swipe them from our hands and say, This is for me? Thank you. By faith we wonderfully proclaim, Of course, you can have it. Father, all I have is yours. Whoever, hears, whoever is of God hears the words of God. Father, this test on earth seems hard, but in heaven it is truly easy. Your Son has taken my death and gives me life eternal. My soul looks back to see the burden Christ did bear. When hanging on the cursed tree, I know my guilt was there. Believing, we rejoice to see the curse remove. We bless the Lamb with cheerful voice and sing his bleeding love. Amen. May the peace of God, which truly passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.